Hello. The purpose of this video is to continue in our theme of using the new Keynesian model to obtain numerical results. You've already seen some other background videos on this and you had to look at the book. Uh, so now we're going to do a little exercise. Now this exercise corresponds to Learning Objective 13.1 in, in the book. Uh, that learning objective is to discuss the algebraic solutions of the ISRTPC model in order to get a feel of how policymakers put simulation models to work. Now, uh, as you may know, uh, uh, most of the time, policymakers, policy organizations, uh, the public sector or international organizations, as well as the private sector, typically give their assessments and their forecasts and, and discuss alternative scenarios in terms of numbers, not graphs. But it turns out that they're using models that are actually similar to the ones that we've used. So we want to be able to get a little bit inside the black box because if you just look at those numbers, they look a little bit black boxy. Where do they come from? Well, one of the themes of this book is that friends don't let friends do black box economics, no black box economics. So by doing these exercises, we hope that we're going to open up the black box a little bit. Now, this is a spreadsheet-based and Excel-based workshop. Uh, we do recognize that not all of our users uh, have, have substantial experience in Excel. Uh, well, we have good news for them because through this, uh, throughout this presentation, we're going to be stopping along the way, uh, not only to discuss the economics, which is paramount, but also to give a few Excel tips, because we feel that Excel is an excellent tool. It's an excellent tool uh, to visualize some of the concepts that we read in the books. It really reinforces things. The results just jump right out at you. So before we begin, I want to go over the some equations here. These are equations that we took a look in the last video. Now, on top here, we have the, the expression for the equilibrium output gap, and we're taking a contributions approach here. Uh, the contributions, we're looking at one, two, three, four elements, four elements here in the numerator. The first element is the expectations gap. So if, for example, uh, inflationary expectations are greater than the central bank's target. We say that the central bank uh, isn't fully credible about its target. So what does the central bank have to do to bolster its credibility? It has to raise interest rates uh, to show that it's a serious central bank. It's serious about reducing inflation. Uh, and in so doing, it's going to squeeze down aggregate demand and it's going to reduce the output gap. And so we expect there to be a negative relationship, an inverse relationship, between the expectations gap and the output gap. Our second element here is the uh, sh our shocks what we call productivity-based shocks to the short-run aggregate supply curve. Uh, we think of this, for example, as a reduction in oil price. That would be a favorable shock. So uh, a reduction in oil prices, a favorable shock. This guy go. Uh, this this is this is a good shock. And if this is a good shock, that means that the gap will go up. Uh, if it's a bad shock. For example, uh, uh, an increase in oil prices that means that the that the gap will go down. So we do expect this 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 supply shock to be positively to be positively related to the output gap. Our third element here is an aggregate demand shock. Once again, we found out that if we have an increase in demand, that should increase the output gap. Uh, more consumption, more investment, or uh, perhaps more from from government spending. Um, and if we have a decrease in aggregate demand, we expect that to reduce the output gap. So this will also have a positive effect. Finally, in terms of discretionary monetary policy, um, we expect that, that an increase in the interest rate on a discretionary basis, we call that a discretionary tightening, that should squeeze out some, some, some consumption and especially investment, and that's going to reduce the output gap. And if we have a discretionary loosening, if we reduce the interest rate beyond below what the Taylor rule would have prescribed, that was going to that encourage more consumption and especially investment, and that's going to increase the output gap. So we would expect a negative relationship here. And once again, in our previous video, the the um, algebra bore us out. So uh, then, what we learned in that video is we take 
this calculation for the equilibrium output gap, and we substitute it in first to the RT curve to get our expression for the real interest rate, and second into our Phillips curve to get our expression for inflation. And then the third thing that we do, we want to get the nominal interest rate. Well, we just take the easy calculation here because we've done a lot of work up here, and that's just the equilibrium real interest rate plus the equilibrium inflation rate. So uh, hopefully we've reinforced conceptually how we make these calculations and that we understand that there's, these are not just algebraic terms, but there's actually some intuition behind them. So now let's turn to our example here. Okay, uh, As before, we're going to be looking at a baseline scenario. Baseline scenario has no shocks, no supply shocks, no demand shocks, nothing here on discretionary monetary policy, and expectations are perfectly aligned with the target. So there's no credibility issues here in the baseline. Now it turns out that in our alternative scenarios, one or two, they're not I, neither one of these scenarios is, go, is, is going to include a, a, a credibility issue in the sense that under both of these scenarios, uh, there is no expectations gap. So right now, we're not discussing the credibility of the central bank. Instead, what's at issue is uh, adverse supply shocks. So you can see here in alternative one, we have a minus 1% ad adverse supply shock. Uh, and also, we're going to have a reduction in demand, and we're, we're envisaging a 0.7% reduction in demand. That's 0.7% of potential output. So here we have, written in English, an adverse supply shock and also a decrease in demand. Now, alternative two is similar, but it's a little bit more complicated. We're going to have a slightly worse adverse supply shock uh, by 0.2%, and we're going to have a decrease in demand uh, also, and it's going to be the same magnitude, but now the central bank is going to step in and accommodate these adverse effects with a discretionary loosening. It's going to reduce interest rates on a discretionary basis by minus, and that factor is going to be minus 1.3%. Now, okay, so the next thing that we have to do is we have to implement this top equation element by element. Uh, 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 according to our contributions approach. So we're going to do the numerator first, and then we're going to divide everything through by the augmented multiplier here that's on the bottom. So let's do that. Now, the first thing we do is we do want to get in the, the expectations gap. So uh, I need to go downstairs where all of the uh, parameters are, and I need to find my Taylor parameter, beta pi. You'll recall that that's the response of the interest rate to changes in the inflation rate relative to the target. And we're going to take that guy, and we're going to multiply that times what? We're going to multiply that times the difference between our expectations uh, and our target, which we've already told you is actually zero. Now. Before I go and press Enter for my calculations, I want to point out that what we want to do is we want to pin down. We want to pin down this element D51 here. This is our parameter, and the parameter is going to be the same across scenarios. So we want to maintain that constant. So that's why we put a dollar sign here and a dollar sign here. Okay, so now I'm going to press Enter, and not surprisingly, we got zero because anything times zero is zero. But you'll notice now I'm going to take this, I'm going to do a little right click here, I'm going to copy, I'm going to bring this over here, and I'm going to do a paste. And you'll see over here that now instead of G11 and G12, we have I11 and I12. So we've changed uh, columns. Okay, So we have a calculation for Alt1 and a calculation for Alt2. Now, our next um, calculation has to do with the aggregate supply. So what we need to do is we need to go down and we need to find, and it turns out that here we have uh, beta pi minus 1, it's already calculated for us. And then we're going to multiply that times 1 over the elasticity of uh, aggregate supply with short run aggregate supply with respect to the price level. And we're going to take that, that, that compound term and we're going to multiply it. And we're going to go up here and multiply it by what? We're going to multiply it by our adverse shock. Now, before once again, I press enter. I want to pin down. I want to pin down the the elements here. So we're going to pin that guy down and pin that guy down. 
Okay, and now I'm going to press enter. And why do I do that? Because once again, I want to copy this over to, to scenario two. And if we sh were actually showing more decimal points, we would see that there's a difference between these two. But you can see here that now we're taking the value for the productivity based shock for. Uh, I, uh, un, uh, for alternative two, not alternative one. Now, our third term here is going to be uh, our aggregate demand term. So once again, we need to go, and I'm going to put one over, and I'm going to go down, and I'm going to find our our response parameter of of, of expenditures, uh, consumption plus investment. And you'll notice that that's a negative term, and that's that we know we already knew that. Uh, just for just to make things very uh, uh, secure here, I want to put this in parens, and then I'm going to go up, and I'm going to find my my aggregate demand term, and here it is. This is the minus 0.7. Okay, now once again, I want to pin down that parameter, so I'm going to press my F4 or just put in my dollar signs, and boom, there we go. And then we're going to take this here, and we're going to copy it over here like that. Okay? Okay, so here we've just done two scenarios, aggregate demand. Finally, we get to rest a little bit because this is not quite so hard. There's no parameter. We just take the interest rate, uh, the discretionary component of the Taylor rule, uh, which we know is zero under alternative one, and then we're going to copy it over to alternative two. All right, so now we've just done the numerator in this term. So now what we want to do is we want to take everything here and we want to divide it through by our augmented multiplier. So let's look down and we have the augmented multiplier calculated for us and we said that augmented multiplier is negative. We learned that in the last video and guess what? It is negative. So now all we need to do here is we need to pin down that augmented multiplier. Okay, And now here we're going to see the real advantage why you want to be learning Excel is because you don't want to be spending your life doing uh, 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 calculations. Uh, we hope that you're not sitting there with a calculator and plugging numbers in because really all we needed to do now is calculate this and we needed to just just copy and paste and we have everything divided by the same number. Now finally we're going to add these up and we're going to have uh, the equilibrium gaps under both of these scenarios. Uh, remember the signs. This is positive, minus, positive, and positive. So here we're going to have this is going to be positive. Uh, actually, you see, I'm doing the wrong thing here. This is going to be positive, and then this is going to be minus, and then this is going to be plus, and then this is going to be plus. Okay? So this tells me that under alternative one, we will have a gap of minus 0.6%. And then I'm going to copy this over here. And this is telling me that under this scenario, alternative two, we're going to have a gap of minus 0.1%. So now what accounts for the difference here? Because it turns out that our supply shock was a little bit more severe uh, in alternative two than alternative one, well, we can conjecture, in fact, that it was because of the discretionary loosening when the central bank reduced the interest rate, when it loosened up monetary policy, that, that, that gave us a result of a recession that was not quite so severe as we would have had here in, 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 in alternative one. So, we're going to cut off now, and we're going to, and when we come back, we're going to uh, uh, get our equilibrium results for interest rates and inflation rates.